a huge divisional round weekend. Now, were the games all of that exciting? Probably no, outside of the Philadelphia Eagles-New Orleans game, but a lot of impacts here on what's going to take place next week. And also, who covered, who didn't cover? Let's get right to it, Teddy. First game of the weekend last week, Chiefs 31-13 over the Colts. Chiefs coming in saying, you know what, Patrick Mahomes, rookie quarterback, how's he going to fare? And oh no, oh no, Teddy, snow all over the place. Totals dropping from 57 to 53 and a half. Let's talk a little bit about that football game, Teddy, and how good that rookie court, excuse me, I should say that, you know, playoff first start quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, look fine to me. Yeah, I mean, what did we say last week? We're like all the first year starters and then there's Mahomes and Mahomes have been the exception to every rule. Yep. In week one of the postseason, we saw the three first time starters all go down. In week two of the postseason, we saw Patrick Mahomes be the exception to that rule. And, I mean, the, the two teams from the AFC that got slapped, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the Chargers got slapped around, the Colts got slapped around. Both those games were essentially over by halftime from a straight-up NATS standpoint. You say, well, what happened to Andy? They were so good. Yeah, they were gassed. When you go back-to-backs on the road, when you go five and seven weeks on the road without the break— like the Colts did, like the Chargers did. You know, the two AFC bye teams were laying in wait for their opponents, and both Indy and L.A. looked a little bit gassed in their respective defeats. Certainly early on, they both got blitzed, uh, and that was pretty ugly if you had an Indy ticket in your pocket. You were never in that ball game under cashes with ease as well in the snowy conditions. Yeah, how about that, Teddy? 57 for most of the week, and then, you know, you get the whole TV ramp up there, snow on the field, which throughout the game, it actually didn't play that big of an impact overall in the game. I mean, sure, made for a little bit of muddy conditions there, but it's always interesting to see a three, three and a half point drop on the game, or excuse me, on the day of the game. And certainly at the end, even though you're looking for a late touchdown by the Colts, there still wouldn't have been enough to get over that total. Kansas City in a complete route and run away the Saturday night football game. The Rams took care of business against the Dallas Cowboys. One of the things that we featured, Teddy, which I think you said right here, if you're going to cash that Rams ticket, you're probably going to cash that over ticket. Both of those worked well. I thought the Rams from start to finish were the most dominant team, even in the first half, Teddy, when it was a 7-3 game that the Dallas Cowboys had the lead. The only thing that wasn't going on was the Rams punching it in the red zone. After a while, they got it going. And again, game sneaks over the total with the last minute touch on a questionable penalty, which again, a lot of people on that total were cheering for. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, depending on which side uh, of that total <laughs> exactly. you had, yep. you were either cheering for or not cheering for as Dallas uh, gets that final score off the questionable, was it a fourth down pass interference call that yep. uh, uh, as a Rams backer I thought was a little bit dicey. Uh, all that being said, the Rams punted once against the Cowboys defense after the game. L.A. was talking about, yeah, we kind of knew what their defensive signals were, which is exactly what the Seahawks said uh, earlier in the season. The Cowboys coaching staff has some answers, you know, uh, for sure, uh, or some questions. Uh, it's, a, you know, uh, Rod Marinelli in particular, I, I thought, had a really rough game plan. Again, the, the Rams punted once, and the only time they punted in the game, I was ready to wring Sean McVay's neck at that moment. Uh, when they were, up, they were up one score at the time, they were fourth and short, in Dallas territory, the Rams don't punt in that spot, but they did there. It ended up working out in their favor after Dallas had to punt back. But uh, Cowboys with the hot start, Rams pretty much dominant thereafter. That was a pretty one-sided game, despite the relatively close final score that shows, even even, even with that, uh, the Rams 7-7.5. Seven, seven Not a great result for the house when they win by 8. Yeah, certainly some questionable coaching decisions, but I can't get enough. C.J. Anderson, almost off the scrap heap now, looking just as good as Todd Gurley. A one-two punch moving forward should be interesting to watch. And a little bit later in the show, we go on the the, uh, off-the-mic subject here about head coaching decisions. Obviously, that was an interesting one by Sean McVay because they didn't even – it wasn't even like they they tried to draw them off sides and then came back. And I thought the declining of the penalty by um, Jason Garrett and that would have forced the Rams to actually go for it, but they didn't. But interesting, the Rams end up pulling ahead. Nice third-down conversion late in the football game to put that one away. Patriots 41, Chargers 28. Teddy, when I first look at the score, I say, man, you know what? Chargers came to play. Absolutely not. It's almost like they were delayed or maybe they were in a three-hour time warp figuring the kickoff was three hours later on Los Angeles time as opposed to what they showed up. A long drive to start the game to set the tone by the New England Patriots. Continue to dump it out in their flat, you know, inching forward three, four-yard grips. And then all of a sudden, at the end of that drive, a flag comes out on a key third down. 
two plays later, the uh, Patriots punch it in to go up 7 nothing, and never look back. I was actually surprised, Ted, because I turned the game off late fourth quarter with everything pretty much already wrapped up. I was surprised the Chargers actually got the 28 points to make it that close. If it was an appearance, it'd be close. But what a runaway by the Patriots. Completely impressive there. And that'll be interesting how this plays in the next week's game with the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, 35-3 to at halftime uh, after mm-hmm. New England punches in their fifth TD. Again, didn't punch uh, before the break, and the game was over. Uh, by uh, halftime. The only question in the second half is whether the Chargers were going to cover the second half number, which they did, and whether the game was going to go over the second half number, which it did uh, on the Chargers' final uh, touchdown. But uh, again, when you see these teams in dismal travel spots, and the Chargers were very much in a dismal travel spot, coming off a huge win, coming off another huge win, et cetera, et cetera, they were gassed. They played like it early, and the Patriots ran all over them. Belichick and Brady have a pretty good track record when it comes to playing postseason games with extra time to prepare, now making their ninth consecutive trip to the AFC Championship game, which is, that's never going to happen again. That will never happen again, what New England is doing right now. No, completely impressive. And also, Teddy, you're going to get that dichotomy next week of how good those Patriots look at home. But if you cross-reference it with the way they play on the road during the season, should be a fun matchup next week in Kansas City. Coming right down to the wire, looked like it was going to be a runaway early by the Philadelphia Eagles, up 14 to nothing. Brandon Graham gets a strip sack fumble but can't hold on to the ball. Even though after that, another series later, the Eagles again found themselves up 14-0 with the football bat midfield. Nick Falls throws an interception, and the Saints just continued to salt that football game away. The Eagles couldn't make any plays on offense. Nick Falls comes up a little bit lame during that game, missing a numerous amount of wide-open wide receivers. But as always, we're gamblers, Teddy. It's 20-14. to The Saints are driving. Looks like they're going to have about a 45-46 yard field goal. Nice play by Michael Bennett. Pushes it back to 52. And a wide right. And the Eagles are right back into it, but comes up with a late interception in there. The one thing I missed on this game, Teddy, I thought there would be more points. One of the one of the uh, wagers I did like is right out of the gate. I thought it was a good one. Eagles go up 14 nothing with about six minutes to go in the first quarter. I was sitting on a 24-and-a-half over ticket in the first half. Would ended up losing by a half point. But overall for the game, 34 total points, well under, well under the 52. It closed that yesterday. Yeah, I mean, uh, after the first two touchdowns for uh, Philadelphia, they didn't score again, uh, obviously, the rest of the ball game. Let's give the Saints defense credit for, A, making adjustments, mm-hmm. and for, B, uh, getting to Nick Foles, and C, for uh, intercepting the pass after it went through uh, all John Jeffrey's hands at the end of the ball game, which was the difference maker. Jeffrey, uh, obviously the GOAT today, even though it was playing with b- b- broken ribs and uh, you know, a gutty performance. Uh, but I thought the Eagles were coming down to win that ball game. I really did. After that missed field goal, and Bennett's going to get credit for the stuff on the third down. I thought the play call was bottom, I mean, inane, bottom line. Everyone knew exactly what the Saints were going to do that game, including Philadelphia. And with the strength of that Eagles defensive line, no surprise that the play turned out to be a dud that forced a 50-plus yard field goal attempt that ended up being the miss that ended up resulting in a Saints cover. Now, had that kick gone in, New Orleans would have probably played a different level of defense on that final drive, and the Eagles might have come in through the back door anyway. But (laughs) the one play, based on the one play call, ended up having a huge impact. ATS, Saints backers don't get the money. Eagles backers cash again as underdogs, just like they've done in every previous playoff game that Nick Foles has been in over the past two seasons. Nope, certainly impressive. Crushing blow for us here in the Delaware Valley. But as we move on, there's more games to look at. We'll get to those a little bit later in the show. That betting show, folks, if you haven't done so yet, give us a follow at SBR Sports Picks on Twitter. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube every time Teddy and I go live here on this show. You'll get that notification. Pop in and check it out. SBRodds.com. All your latest line moves. We'll get to a couple of those in just a few moments. James Harden, Teddy. Hey, if we look at the box score there. Man, drops 38 points. 16th straight time of 30 or more points. But I had to do a double take. I thought it was maybe an error coming across my ESPN ticker, Teddy. One for 17 from three. Anytime something interesting like that pops up with such a great player. One for 16, excuse me, one for 17. It's one of those things where in the playground, like, hey, buddy, stop shooting the three-pointers out there. But an interesting note overall. But more importantly, the Magic pulled a big upset in this game as well. Yeah, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that James Harden was one of 17 (laughs) uh, from a three-point line. I mean, Houston was five-and-a-half-point road chalk. Uh, over Orlando uh, at tip-off. The Magic obviously getting the straight-up victory in large part because Harden 
brick after brick after brick. And I know you got your guy. You let your guy shoot. You know, he'll find his rhythm. Didn't happen for Harden last night. I've never been a James Harden fan. I continue not to be a James Harden fan. I understand the guy can score points in bunches. Show me a ring, Harden. My over-under on his career rings, half, and I'll take the under. (laughs) <laughs> I agree with you there. Talk a little bit of hot stove, Teddy. We talked a little bit on Friday, but some implications coming up over the weekend. Three interesting scenarios here. Manny Machado looks like the White Sox have offered now an eight-year contract. For some reason, we have no idea what the money is. The Phillies contingent fly out to sunny Las Vegas and meet five hours with Bryce Harper, and they are the prohibited favorites now to sign Harper, even though we don't even know if a contract offer was extended in that situation. And the final point here, Trying to get Kyler Murray circled in an interesting little, you know, backdoor policy here for Major League Baseball. They can actually sweeten the pot on getting Kyler Murphy in with the A's. Maybe his agent holds that leverage there. We saw this back way back in the day with John Elway and the New York Yankees where he didn't want to go to the Baltimore Colts. Should we see another situation like this? Teddy, a little bit of hot stove talk here while we talk some football. Uh, sure. And look, uh, the, the one that intrigues me the most of the three, because we're going to hear rumors, rumors. I don't give a shit about rumors. Give me something I can bet on. Give me some facts. You know, uh, the issue with Murray and the A's is an interesting one here because Major League Baseball legitimately doesn't play pay their minor leaguers a livable wage. A livable wage. Minor league players make not they make like two grand a month. You know, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. it's it's insane. And they only um, play three months. Tyler Murray saying, "Yeah, yeah, if you want to play me in the minor leagues, yeah, sweeten the pot a little bit uh, so I can get some cash." Really, baseball as an as an entity, should be paying these minor leaguers more. At some point that'll happen. I don't know if it'll come in the next collective bargaining agreement. But the Murray to the A's or to the NFL, it's interesting. We'll keep an eye on that one right here on That Betting Show. That's right, Teddy, talking about those prop bets, which you always like to get after, ta- seeing like when are they going to sign both of us, I think, in agreements that it's probably going to come later than sooner. So always some interesting stuff here to talk. We'll let you guys know when they do sign, if they don't sign, or any more rumors that come around the mill here. 